Anjil, so we are already live. You can start now. Okay, great. So, um, hello everyone, people who are joining us and coming in, um, and welcome, uh, Professor Guha, for this conversation today. Um, let me first introduce this series called From Yesterday Towards Tomorrow, um, being co-organized by Vikalp Sangam Process. It's a network that is trying to weave alternative initiatives and processes across the country. Um, and uh, why we are doing this series today is to have a space especially for, um, for young people, but people who are interested in examining what is happening in today's world and how do we respond to the crisis that we are facing today. And we are having these series to create a space for people to think about these things, but also to bring in people like Professor Guha and in our earlier conversation, there was Rajni Bakshi and other such people who have uh, who have looked into these crises and are looking into these crises, but importantly, mm -hmm. have also um, looked at our thinkers in the past, their lives and their philosophies. Um, and so the space is to actually engage with those ideas. What does it mean to uh, think about our um, elders now and their ideas, how they can inform our future and our present times? Mm -hmm. Um, and especially in this world where we are living, where it's quick to cancel people, um, we want to create a space where we can discuss thinkers in a holistic way, take from them what's relevant for today's world um, so that it can inform um, what we want to do in the movement spaces in the future. Um, so that's the objective of these conversation series, and we hope to build them um, over the coming few months and years, um, and hopefully uh, have more engagement and dialogue around this. Um, and for today, um, I want to prof uh, welcome Professor Guha. Um, Ramchandra Guha is an Indian historian, environmentalist, writer, and a public intellectual whose interests include social, political, contemporary, environment, and cricket history, and also the field of economics. <laughs> And it's so great to have you with us, Professor Guha. And we would be speaking with him um, uh, about Gandhi's relevance in today's time. And just to give you a sense of what the conversation will be like, uh, it will last for in about an hour. Um, and I will ask some questions to Professor Guha. And then we will have about 15 to 20 minutes for also the audience to come in uh, and ask questions. Um, and as a way of introduction, I'm Shrishti Bajpay. I work with the Environment Action Group Kalpa Riksh. I help in coordinating the Vikalp Sangam process um, and also involved in the spaces where we are talking about environmental justice, political ecology and other such things. So I'm really honored and really glad that um, I will be speaking to you, Professor Guha. And welcome. Welcome to today's conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Shrishti. Okay, so let's um, dive straight into um, our conversation. And my very first question to you is um, that there's a deliberate erasure of memory of Gandhi and even a vilification by some. And do you think he's as relevant today as he was when he was alive? And in what sense is he relevant today? So, Shishti, uh, like every human being, Gandhi uh, contained multitudes. He had many remarkable attributes. He had some flaws in his uh, life as a public activist and a social reformer. He did some daring and visionary things, extremely courageous things. Occasionally, he made mistakes. Uh, sometimes he anticipated the future accurately. Sometimes he did not. Uh, and so that says he is open to debate, contestation. And uh, no one should see him. It was a mistake to have seen him if anyone did as flawless or as godlike. However, uh, after his death, and particularly the last eight or 10 years, there's been a revisionism which has been excessive. Uh, that is motivated by certain ideological tendencies that want to diminish Gandhi, decertify him, uh, attribute all kinds of uh, 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 problems to him and so on, mistakes to him. So I think when you see Gandhi in the round, the, and if you look at him uh, as a historical figure, as I said, he did some very brave and courageous things, uh, trying to forge a movement uh, for freedom, nonviolently, uh, recognizing that 
freedom will be incomplete if uh, Indians continue to treat low caste, that is Dalits and women, uh, in the kind of discriminatory matter in which they had been, become accustomed. It would further be incomplete if Hindus and Muslims, India's two largest religious communities, were at war or were conflicting. So those were quite, some quite remarkable aspects of his work uh, that uh, I think uh, are enduring, and have enduring relevance. But there were other aspects that were not so well recognized then, and um, uh, which actually ha have shown him to be an even more far-sighted and prescient thinker uh, than was thought. And one I'll talk a little bit about is his early environmental consciousness. You know, um, one of the reasons I radically agreed to participate in this uh, discussion, Shristi, is that I have a very long-standing relationship with Kalpana uh, and which goes back four decades. And it's a one-sided relationship in which I have mostly benefited from them. I mean, I have greatly admired their work in con conservation, sustainability, documenting livelihood practices. Uh, uh, they're very uh, public-spirited and non-partisan approach to the environmental movement, building bridges rather than saying, I'm the greatest, I'm the only one, I'm the only true activist. So I've had a very uh, uh, you know, long-standing, uh, and as I said, admiring association with Kalpavik. And hence, I'd like to begin when we talk about Gandhi's relevance today, uh, with his relevance to our environmental predicament. And let me just, for the benefit of your listeners and viewers, uh, recount what Gandhi said in 1928, which is 95 years ago. Gandhi said, and I'm reproducing, repro reproducing his words verbatim, I'll give you a quote from Gandhi, and then I'll explain his relevance to today. What he said in 1928, how it is relevant to us in 2023. So Gandhi remarked, and this is what he said, I quote, God forbid that India take to industrialization after the manner of the West. God forbid that India take to industrialization after the manner of the West. And then he continues, the economic imperialism of a single tiny island kingdom, namely England, is today, 1928, keeping the world in chains. And then he ends by saying, if a nation of 300 million, which is what India was then, takes to similar economic exploitation, it will strip the world bare like locusts. Now, what Gandhi was saying is that the economic progress of England, its industrial uh, form of production, its consumerist way of life, was enabled by its control of colonies in Asia and Africa. Now, once we were free, we had no new colonies to conquer. We couldn't go to Asia and Africa and start conquering them. So we had to live within our own resources. We were much more populous than England. And of course, uh, environmentalists will tell you that tropical ecologies are much more fragile than temperate ecologies. So we had to forge us what we would today call a sustainable path of development. Now, the crucial words, according to me, in that quote I have just uh, recounted to you from 1928 are, in the manner of the West. God forbid to take to industrialization in the manner of the West, which means Gandhi was not opposed to industrialization per se. He was not opposed to economic development per se. He recognized that India was disfigured by desperate poverty, inequality, uh, uh, illiteracy, lack of access to healthcare, clean water. So he would have wanted, and in fact, he did strive all his life to see that the basic needs of Indians were satisfied, you know, uh, clean water, safe housing, dignified employment, access to education and health. But the world simply didn't have enough for us to emulate Western lifestyles. Now, what is happening today is because not just India, which is no longer 300 million, but 1.4 billion, but also China, which is also close to 1.4 billion, they are uh, emulating the Western model of industrialization and consumerism. They, India and China, along with the rest of the world, are coll collectively stripping the world bare like locusts. And of course, climate change is a very clear manifestation of this, but also the state of our domestic environment. You know, the fact that our rivers are biologically dead, the fact that India has the most, in terms of air pollution, the most polluted cities in the world, the fact that our forests are depleted and degraded, that groundwater aquifers are, you know, uh, uh, are being repeated so rapidly that are, there's such high chemical contamination of the soil. So in that sense, this aspect of Gandhi's message, which uh, was instinctive in Gandhi. Gandhi was not a full-blown environmentalist. He was an instinctive environmentalist. He recognized 
इसमें कुछ गलत गलत है यू नो वी कैन एम्युलेट द वेस्टर्न मॉडल होल सेल वी हैव टू थिंक केयरफुली अनफॉर्चूनेटली हिज वार्निंग्स वर डिसरिगार्डेड एंड दे वर रिन्यूड बाय द कंटेंपरेरी एनवायरमेंटल मूवमेंट फ्रॉम चिपको ऑनवर्ड्स व्हिच ब्रॉट अ काइंड ऑफ गांधीयन एथिक एंड अ गांधीयन आर्गुमेंट इनटू द डेवलपमेंट डिबेट सो दैट्स वेयर आई वुड से पर्टिकुलरली फॉर अ यंगर ऑडियंस एंड पर्टिकुलरली फॉर अ इवेंट co-hosted by kalpa rikshan vikram sangam gandhi is most relevant the other ways in which is also relevant we can talk about but his critique of over consumption and destructive technologies and ways of life i think is absolutely central uh, to his relevance today yeah absolutely and i think uh, that brings me to the next question which is um that gandhi spoke about a special kind of spiritual awakening for him spirituality and politics was not separate and um right now the kind of ecological crisis we are facing it's also about the crisis of spirituality um and sacredness um which i guess we have lost even in the most dominant of environment spaces either it has become very technocratic or scientific which is important but then it devoid uh, it's devoid of or ground not grounded in the spiritual elements that is very much part of our lives and so um wh- what do you think and do you think that uh, india at this moment needs a kind of a spiritual awa- awakening not just for the ecological uh, crisis but also for political cultural and uh, other crises that's a good question so first i I'll, i'll talk about gandhi's view of religion in general and why that is relevant you know gandhi believed uh, that every religion he said once every religion has elements of the divine and the devilish you know uh, hindu philosophy hindu upanishad upanishad had very uh, rich and insightful literary and philosophical arguments but we practice untouchability islam uh, admirably preaches equality it does not have a caste system but some sometimes it exalts violence so every religion has a mix of the devilish and divine and gandhi argued that rather than treating your religion as perfect you should have exchanges intellectual philosophical political exchanges with people of other religions and through interfaith dialogue you can improve one another and i think that's of course very relevant to india today where we are still struggling uh, to accord our religious minorities equal rights now with regard to the environmental predicament i would hesitate i have a personal hesitate hesitancy about using the word spiritual i would rather use moral and ethical but that's a personal preference i don't mind if people like you are talking about a spiritual awakening i would rather talk about a moral and ethical awakening where we need uh, to cultivate a greater responsibility a greater sense of care towards our neighbors uh, towards the less privileged members of our own human species and uh, t- uh, towards other non human species as well you know so in that sense a moral and ethical awakening in which i the individual ram goha is not of paramount importance you know that i have to uh, subordinate my interests my needs my greed my ambition to un- ensuring that everyone also goes along with us together and not just uh, you know the less fortunate indians i mean i'm a relatively privileged indian but also the earth the forests the waters the coast you know our collective uh, uh, the uh, you know uh, kind of biosphere and so on so i would say certainly a moral and ethical awakening i mean i'll tell you and indians are are uh, uh, need it in an environmental sense more than others you know uh, shishti every morning i go to kaban park for a walk it's a beautiful park uh, near my house and i take a hours walk because it's meditative and you could call it a spiritual it prepares me you know uh, maybe spiritually but certainly emotionally for the rest of the day now <clears throat> earlier this week was dashera now the day after dashera the park will have uh, garbage littered all over it. not just dashera any holiday it could be christmas it could be eid it could even be gandhi jayanti if there is a holiday children will go families will go and of course they must go and enjoy themselves and the park has been it has been everywhere but those will not be used because we don't care i mean the caste system tells us somebody else will clean up our shit especially the upper caste that's what it said from here so this is an example that i find half a dozen times uh, in my daily practice that 
as I said, the day after the Shara, the day after Eid, the day after Christmas, the day after Gandhi Jayanti, this beautiful park, this really oasis of biodiversity and bird life, uh, you know, which is so wonderful for human beings to experience. And then the nice thing about the common park is that it has people of all classes, all religions, all ages. But yet, uh, when it comes to a holiday, they're boisterous, uh, which is fun. They should have fun. Why not? And, but though the uh, horticulture department of the Karnataka government has thoughtfully placed bins everywhere, they will not be used. So I, this is an every one example of which I encounter often. But generally in our lives, I'd say moral, ethical, you, I, I don't mind your calling it a spiritual awakening, though I don't, I don't use the term myself, towards other members of our own species and towards the earth as a whole, I think is absolutely central uh, to, uh, uh, to how we must reorient our behavior uh, to ensure not just that we don't all collapse, but that we live a more harmonious, more caring, less discontented life ourselves. Yeah, and I think what you're saying is an interesting example of that is actually the river Ganga that's revered and so sacred um, and thousands of people perform rituals every day on her banks, but she's yet polluted and uh, thousands of crores have been spent on it and yet she runs. So I think that is the crisis that we face very particular uh, to our context. Um, and I was wondering, maybe just expanding and building on the other aspects of Gandhi's um, life, but also to relating it to the present crisis that we are facing in terms of cultural, uh, ethnic violence and such things, um, especially, say, for example, the Manipur situation or what's happening in Palestine and Gaza. What do you think would be Gandhi's response to these political, cultural, ethnic conflicts? So obviously, he would seek understand. First of all, he would advocate non-violence. Maybe you feel discriminated against, you know, maybe uh, a particular community in uh, Palestine feels discriminated against. Uh, maybe the Palestinians are, are indeed discriminated against, but maybe they should draw non-violent people taking up the gun. He, uh, on the, that, that's what he would advocate towards those who are the victims of oppression and discrimination. To the state, which wields political power, which has the for military forces, he would say, restraint, respect, and avoid excessive loss of lives. So, uh, both with Manipur and what's happening in Palestine and Gaza, Gandhi would have been appalled by what's going on. But one other thing he would he would he would recommend, particularly to those in power, is the acknowledgement of error, the willingness to acknowledge an error and to make up for it. I mean, Gandhi once famously talked of making a Himalayan blunder which uh, Indian politicians in the last 50 years have said, I've even made a small mistake, even when they made colossal mistakes. I was reading an essay on um, in the Financial Times, uh, which said, on Israel, which said, Netanyahu won't say sorry. I mean, there was a, a horrible intelligence lapse, and the head of the Israeli defense and intelligence said, humse galti ho gayi. they said that in Hebrew, but Netanyahu won't say so. Our prime minister won't even acknowledge that something is happening in Manipur. I mean, in Manipur is now, next week, it will be six months since the ethnic violence started. And I can tell you, Sisti, I'm a historian of India. I've written a thousand page book on the history of independent India. This is unprecedented. Never before it has happened that there's such total polarization in a state, one community against other, like a civil war, you know, absolute, like, sort of like Palestine, right? And there's no acknowledgement of it. And of course, um, uh, there are various reasons for that. It has to go, it has to do with the fact that one religious group is more akin to Hinduism and maybe is more favored by the central government. And we can go into all of that. But it is a really major issue. I mean, it's like, as someone said, when, uh, uh, you know, when the G20 meeting happened, or when, or when Modi went to America, America and met Biden, they said, supposing Biden was coming to India and there was a civil war in Alabama, would he have come? Would he have been silent about it? So I think Netanyahu and Modi in this, these cases have shown a kind of arrogance and insensitivity and unwillingness to acknowledge errors and mistakes. On the other hand, uh, the oppressed and the discriminated have maybe also uh, uh, acted in what, in, in a manner Gandhi would have disapproved by glorifying violence. You know, the fact that uh, what Hamas did, what it did, is unconscionable. There should be no two ways about it. The fact that in, 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 in Manipur, 
both the Maitis and the Cookies have looted police armories to augment their stock of weapons. You know, these are things. So what, it's not enough to blame the state alone. You know, I think even those seeking, often rightly seeking justice and compensation have acted in ways in which Gandhi uh, would certainly have not been happy with. And so um, I would be curious um, to think about whether as people who are involved in these spaces of movement of uh, or broadly called civil society, um, what should be our response? What can we learn from Gandhi, not just from, um, say, the government's perspective, but what as a collective? I think many of us don't know what's happening in Manipur or what the situation is because we've ignored that part of the country completely. So even for, for our own action, for our own work, um, what can we do? No, Shishti, uh, I will answer that question. But first I'll say, I am a scholar, I'm a writer. I actually never self-describe myself as an environmentalist. I'm a historian, a biographer, a student and chronicler of the environmental movement. But I am not an environmentalist. I think some people in Kalpana Riksh are environmentalists. Mela Patkar is an environmentalist. Sundalal Bhagola and Chandi Prasad Bhatta are environmentalists. You know? So, and because I'm really a chronicler and a writer and an analyst, I hesitate from advocating to people what they should do. You know, uh, if, a young, if a young writer or scholar comes to me and says, I want to write a history of the Narmada Andolan, what kind of sources should I look at? I'm happy to advise. But if a young activist says, how do I combat pollution? How do I clean up the Ganga? I'm, I don't have the competence. So I'm very clear about that. I don't I, uh, offer uh, any advice on how to improve society because I, that is not what I'm doing myself. I'm studying how society is sometimes doing awful things to itself. Having said that, I do believe as a student of history in general and of democratic societies and indeed the collapse of democratic societies in particular, I believe civil society is a vital arm of democratic functioning and democratic renewal. You know, civil society keeps the state and the capitalist honest. You know, it keeps both the private sector and the state honest. It's the third pillar, as I think Raghuram Rajan called it, of society. You have the state, you have the private sector, uh, which is very important because you need innovators and entrepreneurs to produce uh, efficiently and to meet the needs of economic needs of people. You need the state uh, to provide welfare, education, health, uh, to ensure law and order, uh, fairness in dealing with citizens. But Civil society is vital to shine a spotlight on the state where it is not upholding the constitution or the private sector where it greed leads it to transgressions like polluting rivers, uh, uh, disregarding the human rights of workers, making them work 16 hours in difficult uh, conditions and so on. So I think civil society is absolutely crucial to democratic function. And there have been two periods in Indian history in which three periods in Indian history which is now modern in the history of independent India, in which civil society has been particularly weak. The first period was immediately after independence because Gandhi died. If Gandhi had lived, he would have nurtured civil society. So the 50s civil society was weak, partly because Gandhi had, but see what Gandhi did, and this, this brings us back to Gandhi. So I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, Shishti, Gandhi recognized what I'm saying. He knew you needed the state and you needed civil society. So. He had, by the late 30s, said, Nehru and Patel will be my political heirs. That's why Nehru became prime minister and Patel became home minister and deputy prime minister. That was entirely consistent with Gandhi's vision. And Nehru and Patel did an admirable job in uniting India after partition, bringing the princely states aboard, giving our minorities safety and security, uh, making sure we adopted a democratic system of multi-party competition. But Gandhi would have also had a vision for civil society, which he would have left in the hands of other people. He was training other people, but he died. Now, so there was a vacuum. And through the 1950s and maybe even 60s, civil society was weak. Then it started renewing itself. In the 60s, you had uh, the birth of organizations like Seva in Gujarat, you know, the remarkable Elabhat and other voluntary organizations. Then came the emergency, which crushed civil society. 
So that was the second period in the, in the 1970s when Indira Gandhi was a kind of quasi dictator, where she had no room for dissent or civil society. Later in the 80s and 90s, there was a rebirth. And Kalpana Vriksh is part of that rebirth. And people like me came of age when all this renewal was going on. And civil society contributed enormously to the deepening of Indian democracy through the 80s, through the 90s, through the first decade of this century, you know, in terms of the growth of environmental consciousness, the feminist movement, the human rights movement, you know, uh, in, making, in enabling progressive uh, legislation is like the um, uh, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. You know, all this is the handiwork of civil society. So civil society from, I'd say, roughly from, I would say, 1980 to 2010, played a very progressive, dynamic role in deepening Indian democracy. It was acted as what it was supposed to be, uh, a check on the excesses of the state and of uh, the private sector, respectively. However, in the last few years, there's been an attack on civil society by this current government. This current government is like Indira Gandhi's government. I mean, there's a very uncanny parallel between Narendra Modi as an authoritarian leader and Indira Gandhi. And I say this, having lived as an adult against under both their regimes and also studied their style of functioning as a scholar. So now civil society is under attack. You know, uh, uh, the abuse of FCRA, of UAPA, and all of that. And so our most remarkable civil society organizations, including those that did amazing work in providing succor during COVID are under attack. Uh, you know, of course, very well of the attacks on environmental groups because the private sector, particularly crony capitalists close to this regime involved in uh, particularly the mining sector do not want any checks. Right. And uh, now, so I think this is a, like the 50s, like the 70s. This is the third period in our history uh, where civil society is weak. In this case, because of a targeted attack by the ruling party, and we should worry about this. This will pass. You know, the emergency also passed. I saw it. I mean, I know that this will pass. And, uh, you know, we will have a loosening of state control and civil society will flourish again. And we should all be prepared for it and participate in that uh, fresh flourishing whenever it comes. But, again, <coughs> From a conceptual and you could say institutional point of view, civil society is as vital, as vigorous, active, flourishing, diverse civil society is absolutely vital to any democracy, as we have seen in our own experience. And I am hopeful that you know in a few years that we'll see a rebirth, a renewal. Even today, many young people do come. You know, uh, I mean, if you see Kalpavik, one of the things I admire about Kalpavik, by the way, uh, is that it has seen generational transitions. You know, I, I, Ashish is just a few years younger than me. I'm 65. Ashish must be 62, 63, right? So, uh, but it's, it's seen people, uh, uh, of Ashish's generation, which had many remarkable people, you know, and I could name them, Sunita Narayan, Amitabh Bhaviskar, many, many remarkable people who are in, in Karpavish. Then the people 10 years younger than them, then 10 years younger than them, then your generation. So this is the way in which civil society renews itself, you know. Uh, and old people must know when to retire gracefully. You know, that's also very important. You know, I think that's that's something a lesson that not every civil society activist in India heeds. You know, there are too many civil society organizations organizations in India where the founder simply won't go. You know, uh, uh, so I think Kalpavik is an exception, and I'd say a welcome and admirable exception in that this generational transition uh, has been facilitated. Yes, thank you, um, Professor Gua. And I think just building on uh, what you were saying about the civil society and uh, Gandhi's Dandi March was something that involved the masses into the freedom struggle. And perhaps because the cause of the salt was something that connected with everybody, um, cutting across caste, class, religion. And so what, according to you, could be the equivalent of salt today that can oh. bring together the masses to pay attention so, to the... Uh, yeah. So I think, uh, Shishti... It's futile to look for one, yeah. <laughs> one overarching concept. In yeah. conditions of colonial rule, Gandhi needed something that would unite people all over India. And he found it in Salt. Right. Now we need local level, local action, you know, uh, action at the level of the street, the locality, the city, the province, the panchayat, the district, the watershed. You know, for example, the, a region I'm particularly familiar with, the Himalaya, where I grew up and where I did my first piece of research. You know. Uh, the Himalaya has some specific problems uh, uh, 
problems specific to it, you know, ecological problems, you know, uh, the unregulated road construction, decline of biodiversity, the depletion of water sources, the problems posed by religious mass religious tourism and the burden it places on the environment of the people. So whether you're in Himachal or in um, Garhwal or in Kumao or in Arunachal, civil society activists across that would you know, have a conversations that will mutually benefit them. So I'd say there's no one issue that can unite all of India. You know, in different parts of India, different issues are important. Could be health, could be education, could be environment, could be water, could be pollution, uh, you know, could be human rights. For example, Manipur today, it could be human rights. So I think these are all, so that was a special condition under colonialism where Gandhi had this kind of uh, inspired idea to unite all Indians on the question of salt. That can't occur again. That's interesting, actually. Um, so then what do you think could India have looked like or if how could India have been in a different situation if Gandhian approach of well-being had been adopted after independence, not a development which is based on the Western model that you were saying earlier? Um, so, what it could like? so I think it's not an either or. So I am not one who thinks the Gandhian approach could have been a moderating influence. You know, we would still may have had some needed some steel mills, some large dams. We certainly would have needed IITs. We would have needed highways. You know, an expansion of our train network. But it would have, it would have been done if a Gandhian approach had been uh, incorporated, with more attention to the rights of those being displaced, to environmental sustainability, to the health of our air, our water, to questions of human rights. You know, so it's it would have, it would have moderated, and even today it should be used to moderate. It's not that we need to go back to the past or glorify the village or think that ancient India or as some Gandhians make that mistake of thinking ancient ancient wisdom has all the tradition solutions and we don't need modern science. But it will have moderating influence uh, and uh, 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 it would have enabled us and it still can enable us to, to develop, to grow, to banish poverty, to enhance human opportunity uh, without imperiling our future as a society, a culture, a civilization, and a species. Um, yeah, so I, I'm wondering whether uh, this notion of well-being that, um, say, Gandhi spoke about, um, in some ways, not maybe uh, in, in his search for truth, which is, I think, a very important uh, aspect of Gandhi's work and writing, um, this notion of well-being must have evolved as well, um, yes. what it started to what it became. Yes. Um, and so I'm wondering whether uh, from your reading of Gandhi, um, but also uh, what you're seeing today, um, is there a sense of, because as young people, we are looking for what kind of futures do we really want? So if we don't want destruction of our environment, then how do we sustain our livelihoods and what does it look like? And it's a question for all of us. And so. In your reading of Gandhi and in your own experiences, what does a better future and a well-being looks like? So clearly Gandhi, you're right, Gandhi's thinking evolved. So there's a, uh, he was seen as a foe of science, as a critic of technology. And he may have been that in his early writings. In Hind Swaraj, he sometimes appears extreme in his rejection of modern machinery and uh, modern civilization. But he modified his views. And in 1925, he gave a speech which I have quoted, where he said, it is a mistake to believe I'm an enemy of science and an enemy of technology. You know, I believe science must be used to serve people, to banish poverty. The scientist must have a social obligation, a responsibility to society. That's the kind of science I want. And he famously admired the sewing machine as a liberating form of technology, maybe even the bicycle. So he was evolving. Uh, and there's no question about, about, about that. The second thing is for Gandhi, when you talk about uh, social, economic, and uh, economic and environmental well-being, which is what the question you posed and what we are concerned with today, it, that is only one aspect of what Gandhi was doing. So Gandhi was not so much thinking about the future as the present, how to get the British out of India, how to do so non-violently, how to... Um, blend the freedom movement uh, with an attack, with a non-violent attack on absolutely pernicious institutions like untouchability, how to bring more women into public life, 
I mean, which he succeeded in splendidly, people don't recognize that in 1925, uh, because of Gandhi's initiative, the Congress party had a female president, Sarojini Naidu, at a time in which there were no women in American or British or French or German politics at all. So Gandhi was dealing with all of this. And of course, not least, the whole Hindu-Muslim question, you know. Uh, uh, and so how to design a sustainable future was a kind of fourth or fifth priority for him. You know, for us, it may be more urgent and more important because of the global environmental crisis we face today. But he was evolving, he was learning. And uh, I think that's very, very important to understand. And you talk about the pursuit of truth. And truth for Gandhi uh, was uh, the pursuit of truth involved engagement, debate, disagreement, and learning from disagreement. You know, uh, he would have been appalled by the fact that the democratically elected prime minister of India will not hold a press conference. I mean, Gandhi's ashram was open. Anyone could come. You, if you and I were alive, we could go to Gandhi's ashram and say, ask him a question or write him a letter, which he would answer, you know, in the newspaper. And of course, he regularly met the press and so on. So he believed that the exchange of ideas, the cultivation of close friendships in which you learn from your friend. I think that, that was very, very interesting to the freedom struggle. It was not just true uh, of Gandhi. I mean, uh, in Nehru's Discovery of India, which is, a, which is a book I would urge all your young readers to read. It's a beautifully written book and a very rich and deep and insightful meditation on what being an Indian means. In Discovery of India, which he wrote in prison, in the preface, he talks about what he learned from his fellow prisoners. What Sadar Patel taught him, what Moral Azad taught him, what Kriplani taught him, what Ranidhar Prasad taught him, and what the different perspectives, you know, one knew more history than him, one knew know more economics than him, one had a greater knowledge of Indian languages than him, and he talks about all of that. Right? So this is the way in which, you know, all of us must grow. And I think that is part of Gandhi's, uh, as uh, the historian David Hardiman, who has written very insightfully on Gandhi, he's a a hist British historian who's done a good lot of work on India and actually knows Gujarati, so he understands Gandhi very well. He said, uh, he writes somewhere, Gandhi had a dialogic imagination. So his, it was, dialogue was crucial to his function. He said, Gandhi, so I think that's something which is true, should be true, not only of our top leaders, the Prime Minister, the Congress Party President, etc., but also of all of us, you know. And I think we sometimes think, you know, powerful, successful Indians including the corporate sector or editors of newspapers think they know everything. You don't need to learn. But I think dialogue, interaction, learning, uh, which is something Gandhi, Gandhi practiced, you know, listening, listening, learning. And I think that's, that would be vital, uh, to, uh, you know, for it's absolutely a vital um, kind of, you could even say a moral tendency, which we need to inculcate. Yeah, absolutely. And also in a lot of our Eastern traditions, we see that dialogue was such an important element disagreement was an important element um and in the increasingly polarized world and arguments it's so difficult to even talk to people with different opinions even within our own sectors we yeah. are sometimes yeah. so polarized. what one one point on say that hmm. gandhi practiced non-violent in words violence in words not just in deeds hmm. and uh, the great american civil rights leader john lewis who died during the pandemic was once asked what he learned from Gandhi. He was a very great admirer of Gandhi. He came to India many times. He went to Sevagram and so on. And he said, I learned from Gandhi how to disagree without being disagreeable. Mm. I mean, the kind of vicious abuse and invective that you'll see on our social media today. You know, by all means, disagree. If you have a different point of view, put forward why you disagree, but without being disagreeable. You know, mm. and I think that is something politicians everywhere, not just in India, but in America, in Israel, in Palestine, everywhere could learn. I mean, the kind of whole atmosphere of debate is poisoned and vitiated by the language, the coarse and vulgar and abusive language. And there's an Urdu word, tamiz, you know, which is civility. And Gandhi's language was all, almost full of tamiz. I mean, there was no name calling. There was no abuse. There was no name calling. Yeah, absolutely. And the kind of, um, I think one important objective of this conversation is also to remove this sense of like seeing people, uh, cancelling people because we disagree to them on exactly. certain things, but absolutely. rather 
them as a whole. Um, so also seeing Gandhi and our thinkers in the past as a whole, um, rather than just one opinions of them. So um, I have a last question, and that will be one last one from my side, and then we will open up for the audience. And I would urge uh, the. I've lost you, Sisti. Uh, yeah, I think she is frozen. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're fine now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. I know you mentioned that um, I don't um, I don't preach about what you should do uh, as as an activist, etc. But um, I, I'm still curious because you've read Gandhi and also other thinkers, but um, also living in this public space. And I'm sure uh, there's some things um, that you have as an experience that we all can learn from is that what as young people, uh, how we can respond and organize while we are inheriting this world uh, in crisis and what advice would Gandhi have given us um, because it's I, I think crisis have always been part of human condition as we were also discussing in the last conversation but there's something unique in terms of the kind of ecological crisis we are facing today uh, which is unprecedented and in also uh, something that we have already crossed planetary boundaries etc so there is an eco anxiety there's so much going on in the world um how, how do we how do we organize? What advice would Gandhi give? I, and said, I can't really give advice, but I can give young people this advice. Uh, you know, uh, seek, learn, interact. Uh, uh, you know, uh, don't be uh, uh, and don't be attached to your gadgets. Uh, I think I was lucky that I grew up in a time where there was no television and no smartphone. So I, you know, I'm like appalled. Among the things I used to do, I talked about going to Common Park. When I was a young boy, in fact, all through college, I was an active cricketer. I was a sports sportsman. And today I go, I pass the cricket, the, the uh, Bangalore Cricket Stadium is next to my park. When I pass it, I see these boys, instead of talking to each other, boys are on their phone, you know. So I think that is something, you know, of course, listening to music is something that... Uh, it, so I, that's, I think you could say what is called... Uh, Slowing down one space of life. I think like there's slow food, there's slow music. This that is vital for uh, peace of mind, and it's also vital for environmental sustainability. You know, slow life. You could say. I mean, Gandhi has a wonderful line about uh, about uh, this maniacal desire of modern civilization to destroy distances. That I want to travel by plane everywhere. I want to destroy distances. The animal appetites that fuel modern civilization. So I think slowing down slow life, even for young people, I think it'll, it'll also, I think, uh, make you much more contented, contented uh, mentally and emotionally. Well, thank you so much, Professor Guha. And then there are questions um, right now in the chat box and I'll just read out them to you and you can respond. Why did you pick one by one, whichever ones you feel are and then I, I can answer. Vivek Negi asks, today many people in civil society seem convinced that a change is only possible from minority and marginalized sections who are not exposed to mainstream economic, social, cultural systems and worldviews. So what do you think are major work action required in the coming decade to being a change and upliftment of society as a whole beyond majority minority dualism? Yeah, so I think Gand the Gandhian approach was, of course, there were clear priorities he had. He thought, uh, you know, uh, obviously social inequality was bad. But talking about cancel culture, he didn't think rich people were evil. Or he didn't think Brahmins were evil or men were evil. He thought discrimination against Dalits and women was cruel, unfair. But he, everyone was possible of redeeming themselves. I mean, his idea of trusteeship, you know, that rich people should give, you know. So it's... It can still be used to spawn philanthropy, and some there are some, uh, you know, wealthy Indians who have given back. So all of us, I mean, the idea that there was a particular kind of person in the Marxist worldview, only the proletariat can contribute. You know, in the majoritarian worldview, only the Hindu has a right to India. That is not how Gandhi saw it. Right? So all of us, in our own way, in different uh, forms with different uh, uh, levels of intensity and involvement can help work make this world a better place.
Yes, thank you. Um, and Abhinav Saxena asks, I see Gandhi's ideas of democratic decentralization, decentralization expanding to the ideas of decentralized renewable energy, especially with its relevance to current socio-ecological crisis. So your opinion on this, please, with Gandhi's view on science and tech, which are highly centralized and technocratic. That's a very good uh, question. And I would say, of course, decentralized technology, energy, water conservation. I mean, uh, Instead of large dams and large storages, uh, you know, renewing sources of water availability everywhere. I mean, if you look at the city I live in, Bengaluru, it once had 70 lakes. Now those lakes are either polluted or taken over by the real estate lobby. So our water, we have to go to Kaveri 80 miles away and pump it up uh, 2,000 feet. So water conservation to decentralized methods, are again, I also recommend the work of the late Anupam Mishra, who did amazing work on whose work you will know, you know, for young people may not be aware of his work in Hindi and in English. So, but also political decentralization is vital. You know, uh, one of our progressive legislations uh, uh, is the 73rd and 74th Amendment, but we have never fully realized those and uh, enabled those legislations. So we have panchayats, we have municipalities, and uh, under the, we even have 30% reservation, well before reservation in parliament for women. But these panchayats and these municipalities have no powers, very limited powers of taxation, of, uh, of management of natural resources. For example, I talked about mining. One of the most destructive economic activities in India is mining. And it's destructive not only of the environment, but of social fabric. You know, So today what happens is that there is a coal deposit. Uh, it could be coal, it could be bauxite, it could be gold, it could be anything uh, in a particular state. The chief minister of that state or the central government signs a contract with their favored industrialist and hands over the whole thing to them, right? Now, the local community gets nothing except dispossession, pollution, uh, you know, degradation of their water sources, their cultivable land going out of cultivation. Now, what if decision making was decentralized and the local community said, okay, you can mine, uh, but we will ensure that it's environmentally sustainable. You have to give us a stake not just as workers, but maybe even shares. You know, why can't, say, uh, Adani mine in Jharkhand have 25% shares to the local tribals? Give you a, these are concrete things that actually could are possible if we give flesh and blood, if we empower those legislations. So decentralization is very, it will be not just in terms of technology, but in terms of management and political organization. Uh, for environmental sustainability, decentralization is crucial. And I think we haven't given enough thought to it because we try and centralize everything. I mean, I think now, for example, the, now we are rolling back the Forest Rights Act. One of the things the Forest Rights Act did was to allow local communities to manage their forests. And if you go to some parts of Maharashtra, I mean, I myself have traveled in areas around Gachiroli, and you've seen how decentralized forest management has led to a flourishing of the local e ecosystem, also to an enhancing of the ecological uh, the, and economic opportunities of those uh, tribals and peasants and in fact are declaring out migration to the uh, city because they find employment here and they replenish their own forest because a local community is much more responsible than an anonymous bureaucracy like the forest department let alone uh, you know a mining company right so uh owned in uh, bombay or Ahmedabad or calcutta or somewhere right so i think political that's a very good question that uh, you know has been asked that not just in terms of technological innovation but political empowerment, decentralization is vital to environmental sustainability. Yeah, I think along with maybe decentralization, it's also about when communities say no, that we don't want mining in our forest. Um, we ensure that that is also an important part of the consideration because it's not just the Absolutely. distribution of resources, but it is also some communities absolutely no destruction of their sacred lands on forest as absolutely, well absolutely um so next question is by akash of how do you look at the notion of gandhian village and today's evolving version of the village and how does the how does it impact the counter, contemporary development framework so you see gandhi uh, uh, perhaps occasionally unduly romanticized the village he did talk i mean obviously gandhi has a vision of an ideal village uh, where he talks about, in an article of 1937, which I've quoted in some essays, he talks about my my ideal village would be have a panchayat to settle disputes, uh, a water source common to all, grazing lands common to all, 
uh, a temple, a school, etc. But they were caste distinctions. And many, uh, for a Dalit, uh, as Ambedkar famously said, for a Dalit, a village is a den of iniquity. And the city is the escape. Because you are more anonymous, you're not marked by your caste status in the, in the city, right? So, or, uh, or less marked. So it is a complicated business, maybe, you know, social reform in the village with some amount of urbanization, but urbanization done with some sense of ecological. It's, it's you know, I think how to work out that balance uh, is an arduous task. But it's true. It is true that uh, the urban industrial way of life uh, pioneered by the West and being uncritically emulated by India and China is unsustainable. It is, as Gandhi said, stripping the world bare like locusts. That is true. On the other hand, uh, traditional village life was marked by inequality, oppression, discrimination against Dalits and women, uh, sometimes ignorance, superstition, uh, you know, and other things that lack of education that we would like to remove. So how to work out this balance is the great question of the 21st century. You know, we can't all live like Americans, uh, and we certainly all know can we live like you know wealthy residents of uh, Indian cities like Bangalore, right? So I think, but how to forge this happy mean, this golden mean, where we uh, you know enlarge our opportunities, where we end poverty and discrimination, where we uh, try and see that as many citizens, ideally every citizen has a dignified and uh, uh, you know, you could say enabling life without destroying the circumstances of life, you know, and that is really the great uh, moral, technological, institutional, uh, uh, if you will, spiritual dilemma of the 21st century, which we all have to collectively try and grapple with and so on. Yeah, and I, um, I correct me if I'm wrong, but I also feel that Gandhi had this theoretical framework, which was not a Western theoretical framework to look at the societies and to examine societies and talk about it in a very different sense. Whereas um, much of our thinking about societies is still very much in the Western framework, which is part of the crisis. And so I disagree. I don't think that's a helpful way of looking at things. You know, it's not Western or Eastern. In fact, if I look at Hind Swaraj, which is seen as typically seen as Gandhi's uh, attack on Western civilization. If you look at the references he cites, they're mostly Western writers, including dissenting Western writers like Ruskin and Morris and Carpenter, who warned of the excesses of the Industrial Revolution. Ambedkar drew a, drew a lot from the West. You know, uh, his, his moral philosophy came from Western uh, thinkers, but then his spiritual philosophy came from Buddhism, you know, later on. So this West, you know, we must do what is most relevant, most appropriate uh, to our circumstances. We must be guided by principles like justice, morality, environmental sustainability, care and respect for other human beings, for other species. And in this endeavor, what we draw on Western traditions, what we draw on Indian traditions is, you know, we have to draw on the best of both. You know? So I have a problem with, because actually, I've always had a problem with this. You know, and many years ago, I. Uh, well, it's now 35 years ago, I wrote a critique of, uh, which Ashish and some others may remember, of Ashish Nandi's uh, kind of uncritical polar polarization of West versus East. But now it's much more timely because of this glory, this glo absurd glorification of ancient Indian culture, uh, you know, that we are now, that the current regime is promoting. So we have to think of our values. What do we want? As I said, mm -hmm. we want justice, we want dignity, we want interfaith harmony, we want environmental responsibility. What are the intellectual, institutional, moral, organizational resources that will help us fulfill these values? Hmm. They may come from the West, they come, may come from China, they may come from Japan, they may come from America, they may come from India, they may come from Gandhi, they may come from Ambedkar, they may come from you know Karl Marx, they could come from the Buddha. Doesn't you know? I think that's so. This the provenance of the origin of an idea is not important; its relevance and timelinesses. Yeah, very important point, actually, especially in when considering these many ideologies that exist and not getting polarized on them. 
So Nishant has a question that in the book, Hinswaraj Gandhi ji talks about Hindi being a universal language for India. He says the book, a universal language for India should be Hindi with an option of writing it in Persian or Nagri characters. Yeah. India being a diverse culture with hundreds of languages uh, and dialects, I would like to know the speaker's opinion on this. Yeah. So I have thought about this, I've written about it also. You see, uh, Gandhi also believed that every major language of India should have a space. The reason we have linguistic states, that the Tamil Nadu has Tamil, Karnataka has Kannada, is because of Gandhi. And because we encouraged all these languages to flourish, we did not go the way of Pakistan, where Urdu was imposed on East Pakistan, leading to the splitting up and the creation of Bangladesh, or the way of Sri Lanka, where there was a civil war because they tried to suppress the Tamil language and said Sinhala must be the only official language. Now, in India, as India evolved after the 1950s in the creation of the linguistic states, uh, English and Hindi both served as linked languages. So I, in, I'm in Karnataka. In the South, Southern states do not want Hindi as a linked language. They want English because it's neutral. So, but as it happened through the Hindi film, Hindi also spread. So for, some, for a resident of Karnataka who went to Maharashtra, if they were dealing with science, ecology, law, they would converse with the Maharashtrian counterpart in English. In the, in, but in the, in, the, in the suburban train, they were happy to speak Hindi also. So English and Hindi have both served as Hindi languages and for different purposes, for different groups. And we should have allowed that to flourish. However, the current regime wants to impose him, Hindi only and abolish English. Right. And that will be resented by the South very much. It will also cut us off from global trends. You know, if the Germans are happy to speak English, it is absurd for the Indians not to say so. And, you know, Rajagopalachari, who was the great Tamil statesman, who opposed Hindi imposition, once said, you know, he said, if Saraswati is the goddess of language, she gave birth to all languages, including English. So English is also an Indian language. Now, that's a humorous way of putting it. But I think we should allow English and Hindi both to flourish as linked languages and not the banishing of English and the compulsory promotion of Hindi on southern and eastern and northeastern states. I think it will lead to a Pakistan or Sri Lanka-like situation where there will be fissures and tensions which we don't need and we don't want. Absolutely. Um, and so I know we have to finish at sharp six. So just a last question and then we will wrap up. There is a conversation uh, in the chat going on around um, con consumption and what could be the limits to consumption and needs and wants. And um, also in relation to that, what is real happiness? Um, so maybe all put together if you want to reflect on this idea as well. So not real happiness, but consumption, yes. So what's happening now is that people are looking for a purely technological solution to climate change. And that's being promoted by the great capitalists of the world who might be otherwise admired like Bill Gates or some of our own wealthy billionaires uh, who want one magic wand solution, you know, green hydrogen, etc. right? Without doing anything to their own consumption, you know, while still having... Uh, you know, a 25-story apartment, a private plane, you know, uh, uh, six houses or 12 houses all over the world. I think, obviously, technology is important. So, unfortunately, there is an element in our environmental movement in India uh, that was rejected modern technology. That was a big mistake. So, we need technological solutions. We need political solutions like greater decentralization. We need democratic solutions like more transparency, a free press, more exchange. We need moral solutions like a personal uh, limit on consumption. You know, why should one travel in a private plane if, you know, you can, if, if you are, if you're older, you want a little more comfort and you can afford it, you can travel business class. For example, if you're one of our uh, wealthy Indian, why a private plane, you know? So I think all of these are important, you know, and I think li uh, uh, limits on consumption, either posed individually or institutionally, or enabled by technology, so that you have a local source of energy and a local source of water. All these have to go together. But unfortunately, today I find, because I just recently uh, got a book called The Technological Solutions, blurred by all the most famous Indian and foreign capitalists, thinking technology will save us, which means we don't have to do anything. 
we have to do, don't have to moderate our own lifestyle in any way. I think that is a huge problem. Techno on the other hand, the glorification of voluntary simplicity, not everyone could live like Gandhi. You know, not all of us can live like Gandhi. Some of us may want a cycle or a motor car or a nice holiday once in a while, you know. So I think it's the goal, but moderating consumption is also as important as technological and institutional and political change. Yeah, thanks so much, Professor Guha. That was a lovely conversation. So much Thank to you. Tom. Um, thanks for joining us. And thanks to all the audience for your um, extremely uh, thoughtful questions and comments. Uh, and sorry if we missed any of your questions. Um, we will be back uh, with another thinker um, and with another conversation thinking about um, future um, with also be mindful of the past. Um, so thanks again, everybody. And the links are in the chat box for you to follow and be updated about this. And thanks again, uh, Professor Gua, and hope we Thank continue you. the conversation. Thank thanks. You. Thank you.